two of my colleagues from the D School who work on K-12 education specifically, who are gonna be speaking today. Laura McVean is a designer, educator, and co-director of the K-12 lab at the Stanford D School. As a human-centered designer, her work focuses on understanding the ecosystem of innovation and finding meaningful opportunities to advance racial and social justice. Prior to the D School, Laura worked for 15 years at High Tech High, serving as the Director of External Relations, Principal of two school sites, and as a founding teacher. She's taught middle and high school students in both charter comprehensive schools. Laura has a bachelor's from Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, and a master's from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. When she's not designing for the future, she's cooking, paddle boarding, and knitting a never ending sweater. We'll ask her to share that sweater later today. Uh, I'm also pleased to introduce Devin Young. She's an educator designer who operates with a deep belief in the power of empathy to drive change. She currently runs Designing Learning, an education consulting organization that supports K-12 schools in bringing design methods and mindsets into their teaching and learning practices. Previously, she worked for SFUSD Middle Schools and spent six years as the program manager and learning experience designer for the d K-12 Lab, where she helped launch initiatives like Shadow Student Challenge, Discover Design Thinking Workshop Series, and many others. She's got a bachelor's degree from the University of San Francisco and a master's from UNC Chapel Hill. Hill, Hill. Uh, that's the Tara Heels from Chapel Hill. When she's not teaching and designing alongside educators, you can find her doing yoga, hiking, or dancing to live music at one of many concert venues in the Bay Area. Together, they work with educators around the world to leverage design in their communities. I'm going to ask Devin quickly to share her screen because she's going to be sharing slides today. And then I'm going to do a little bit of uh, tech nerdiness with you all just to make sure everybody works. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you hit view options at the top of your screen and then scroll down to side by side view, what this is going to do is reset Zoom's default bad setting to give you a better viewing experience. So if you go to side by side view, now you can probably either see me or lots of people on the right hand side there. And then there's two little lines. If you put your cursor over those two lines, you can yank them over and make the slides not the predominant thing of the experience. Our hope is that we are facilitating human connection, not content connection primarily. So at least make the screen 50-50. I mean, it's not that I want my head to be as big as the slides, but you better believe I want Devin and Laura's heads to be as big as the slides, because the point is to establish human connection. So hopefully that gets set. There's some amazing uh, attendance from all over. We've got Ontario, Berkeley, Dallas, Michigan, Richmond, Virginia, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., Madison, Wisconsin, Pune, India, Cleveland, San Francisco, Dakar, Senegal, Warsaw, Poland, Oxford, all over the place. Brazil, Sao Paulo. Hi, Luciana. We're so glad to see you all here. We're so humbled by your enthusiasm, and we hope that you get a lot out of this session. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Devin and Laura. And please use the chat. We can make sure that there's a vibrant discussion going and whatever happens to be interesting to you, drop it in chat if you've got questions. And if Devin and Laura aren't able to address them in the moment, for sure we'll circle back and make sure that we get to address at least the most uh, meaningful or the most upvoted questions of the session. With that, Devin, Laura, please take it away. Yeah. Um, you can't leave the screen just let, uh, yeah, Jeremy, I think we wanna like, Let's start by congratulating and giving Jeremy a massive round of, of kudos. And just to you, one, I've never done the split screen uh, thing that you just taught me. So I feel like every day I am learning from Jeremy all the time. I and, I also, I and, I, and I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge Jeremy in particular, because this, this whole concept, this idea of masters of creativity, how we inculcate, create, inculcate creativity in our daily lives, and our practices and how we bring this into our context was the the birthplace of Jeremy's mind. He was the one that said, wow, we should start doing this together between K-12 exec ed and the exec ed team has been the producers of this. Jeremy has been the mastermind of this. And so I just want to like give a massive shout out to Jeremy, Jao, Catherine, uh, Perry, the entire exec ed team. We're actually making this possible because I think one of the amazing things about working at the D School is the cross collaboration between sectors, exec ed, K-12, 
social systems. And I just want to take a moment for Jeremy to having the insight to like, let's do this together. What might we build together? And how do we actually be all get creative, right? In every sector that we're doing. So we love you, Jeremy. We love you, Jao. Uh, and we just want to say quick congratulations and thank you for giving us this opportunity to share some work yeah. with you. It's, it's my, it's our privilege. It's a team effort, certainly. Uh, and there's an amazing team at the D School and the Exec Ed team and the D School more broadly that we get to participate in and contribute to. And to, to uh, have the opportunity to learn from people like Laura and Devin is a true pleasure to get to shine a spotlight on their amazing thinking and impact and hopefully share it with a much broader audience. That's our goal. We want to be unleashing creative, not just creative confidence, but creative competence and creative mastery. And we're all on this journey together. I would say for myself, just in our WhatsApp groups, I get as much out of the comments as I, I get way more out of the comments than I give for sure. And our goal is to be cultivating this community of practice where we can all be growing in our journey of mastery together. None of us are at the mountaintop, but as Randy Hetrick said in the session yesterday, the guy on the top of the mountaintop or the woman on top of the mountaintop didn't fall there. She climbed <laughs> there and hopefully we're all on that creative climb together. So it's a privilege to be on the creative climb together with you. And I, I appreciate your appreciation, but right back at you. And I can't wait to hear what you all have to share today. That's, I think, uh, thank you, Jeremy. And I think, especially now, I think in all of us, there are educators on this call from all over the world that are teaching every single day. And the more that we can express grace and gratitude and care for the people within our community, um, the better, right? And how do we do that together? So uh, again, my name is Laura McBain. I work with, uh, with obviously the amazing Jeremy and Devin and a few other folks on this call right here. Um, and we're just gonna jump into collaborative community problem solving. Um, it is a concept um, that we're gonna share, but before we get into that, um, Devin is gonna kind of run us through us and give us, give everyone a little bit of overview of what this work is looking like. But um, before we get there, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of what we do in the K-12 lab and what we've done around how we actually, you know, bring creativity, problem solving um, into community. So Devin's gonna play uh, Jack DJ here for a little bit, but. Um, you know, one of the things that we do at the K-12 lab is we of course utilize human-centered design, right? Approaches to solving big, wicked problems. And design historically has been about how we uncover design in our group in the K-12 lab has always been about how do we serve as um, a catalyst for creative confidence to unlock creativity within communities, but ultimately how we actually use creativity and creative confidence to dismantle and obliterate opportunity gaps by designing new and equitable models um, for design approaches. Our aim is always around designing for racial justice, designing for social justice within schools. And so we are always thinking about not only how we uncover problems, but how we help people think of themselves as designers, because we believe everyone is a designer. Everyone can shine and everyone can inculcate this creativity in their daily life. So how do we do that? Um, so another thing that we do um, in our work is we spend a lot of time working with educators. There's a whole bunch of people on this call that I know, like Aaron and Michelle. Um, so we spend a lot of time um, spending time with educators working on design trainings. We also, um, thank you, we build tools. So this is an example um, of a puzzle bus that we did. Um, my colleague Mark Chun is on this call, but um, we spent a lot of time creating kind of bold prototypes that help people reframe how to solve problems. This example right here, um, yes, Michelle, we missed the puzzle bus too, but this is an example of an escape room. And the purpose of that prototype was essentially to reimagine and reframe how we think about assessing collaboration, um, communication, and creativity. And so we put a, an escape room inside of a, a truck and named it the Deeper Learning Puzzle Bus to help educators um, reimagine how they assess those type of competencies in their classroom. And then lastly, um, we spend a lot of time um, working with networks. This is an example of a, a, an experience we had right before the pandemic called our Futures Fest, where we brought communities together to think about how they're shaping the future in their own communities using design using creativity, using working toward equity, but we spend a lot of time working with networks around the country who think about how they can actually build a better, more equitable community of learning for their communities. So we've done a lot of this. And what that looked like over the last number of years, um, if Devin wants to go to the next slide, is thinking about 
discover design thinking. So I'd say for the last first seven years um, at the D school and in the K-12 lab, we developed a program called Discover Design Thinking. And that program essentially helped educators, students understand design thinking. And what that looked like was a program that worked with educators around the country to help support educators in solving challenges to their communities. It um, leveraged, uh, for some of you know, the hexagon process of design where we look at empathy, defining, ideation, prototyping, and testing. And it started with this basic process. And we spent a lot of time uh, really working with educators across the country, teaching them this process, helping them use this process in their own way to really find and solve problems in their communities. Now, not surprising, after a number of years of doing this, you start to see different things. And what we saw was that educators were finding new and cool ways to use design that actually we had never thought of. They had found ways to reframe it, to redesign how they teach design. And within that piece, we saw a lot of innovative practices emerging. And it made us wonder, when we're working with educators, not only how can we teach educators about how to use design, how we might uncover and amplify the innovative practices that the educators in our communities are already doing. How do we shine a light on those practices that we know work within their communities because they designed it themselves? How do we actually do that in a rigorous, thoughtful, and actually method methodological way that actually makes sense, that actually shines and understands how the design practices and innovative practices that educators are doing are working to solve some of the challenges that they're focusing on, but really focusing on how these practices are coming out of their own communities. Yes, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh. <laughs> I'll take over from Laura here, um, but hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Devin, uh, as Jeremy, thank you for the introduction earlier. And um, yeah, Laura, Laura did a really great job about of laying kind of the groundwork about what the K-12 lab has been doing in the past in the way that we have used design thinking and design thinking methods and uh, methods and mindsets in, in our work. And, uh, and, and, you know, she kind of landed with that question, like, how, how can we kind of continue this type of work and kind of look, look beyond to find ways to further empower in educators to be doing this own work within their own communities. And when you think about design thinking and kind of the traditional design approach, uh, it, it kind of uses this type of, this type of approach. Um, you look at what's not working and try and figure out a way to fix it, right? Like plugging in the hole or figuring out a way um, to, to, to solve something that isn't working. So you're essentially viewing problems through a deficit lens. Um, generally, the, the, uh, the, you, the solution is uh, found or at least guided by experts who have experience in design or design thinking and can help educators help yourselves bring a novel perspective to your problem. And uh, generally the implementation comes as a top-down outside in approach where both the solution and the dissemination process is kind of provided to the school community. Um, and, and there's, there's you know, support and there's opportunities for uh, folks to kind of be involved in the implementation, implementation process, but generally it's kind of handed to, to back to the school and said, this is the way that we believe is the way to, to solve this problem. And um, so, as we were working on, on this, this work and trying to think about ways to kind of further empower communities um, and, and educators to be doing this work on their own, uh, we, we asked ourselves, what if we started doing the exact opposite? Uh, what happens if we flip our approach and uh, kind of think about this in, in, in a different way? And so uh, in other words, we, we stop looking at what's not working, but start looking at what is working, what's right here, kind of looking at it as an asset-based lens. Uh, rather than looking at the roots of the problems, we start to look for solutions or bright spots uh, that are showing successful outcomes already. And these problems aren't necessarily found by folks who would be identified as experts. Uh, they're found by individuals that are like us. They are found by individuals that are deeply immersed in the school community because they work within the, in the school. So meaning they have similar or the same context and environment and are finding success given no additional resources. And when you think about implementation, uh, rather than kind of uh, approaching it from that top-down outside-in approach, you, we re you rely on the community to help determine the best way to scale and spread successful outcomes. 
And so this led us to this new approach, uh, positive deviance or community-led problem solving. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that Laura and I will be using both terms interchangeably through the rest of this presentation, but they effectively are the same process. Uh, this, this framework has resulted in profound success in many, many industries like healthcare, nutrition, and business, but we found that it hasn't really been adopted widely as a design process in K-12 education. This quote is taken from The Power of Positive Deviance, How Unlikely Innovators Solve the World's Toughest Problems by Richard Pascale, Monique Cernan, and Jerry Cernan. Um, and this literature and research has really served as our guiding light as we kind of move through this work. So ju just briefly, um, I won't read the entire quote, but essentially this positive devious operates on the belief that there's one person within the community that has solved a problem that has confounded others. And that person has no additional resources, nothing else uh, beyond just something that's happening within their own work that's enabled them to, to solve this problem. Um, what we that The person does not necessarily know that they're doing anything unusual. They don't know that they're an outlier or a bright spot until they're informed. But that solution, once it's discovered and understood, can be taken and adopted by their wider community and then solve and transform many lives. So we saw this approach as a complementary use of design. It's not necessarily throwing away the design methods and mindsets that we have traditionally relied on and used successfully in, in a lot of our work in the past, but we saw this as an opportunity to add to our design toolbox. Rather than approaching problem solving uh, by identifying those new and creative solutions and then figuring out how to introduce those new solutions to a school community, what if we first paused and asked educators to look to the left, look to the right of you and see what's already working and then figure out how to scale that idea across your school community? Um, this idea could be the, the implementation and kind of scaling this, this idea is a lot less risky because rather than figuring out how to introduce and implement a brand new idea, you would already know the idea would work because it's already working, right? You are finding these solutions because they're working and they're, they've been uh, kind of found and practiced by someone, that, someone within your community. Uh, so th this is the, the, the process of positive deviance is about identifying that person, identifying that outlier or that bright spot, and then figuring out what they're doing differently. That's resulting in such profound success. So want to say, just like with design thinking, uh, positive deviance, we're not saying this is a panacea, right? This is not the end all be all uh, solution to all problems that are persistent in schools. Uh, we, we found that this uh, process is best used with intractable problems. Um, and intractable problems are problems that are really resistant to permanent solutions. Things that you have been kind of trying to work on for years and years and years. And every time you kind of introduce a new solution, it just shows up again in a different form or maybe in the same form. Uh, these problems are something that's specific and measurable. Um, you can say that you want to kind of increase or decrease something in, in order to get from a single percentage count to a different percentage. And uh, this problem can be solved through a change in human behavior. So this isn't something that uh, necessarily, is, is, it's not necessary to have kind of a big policy initiative change or to have you know, a, 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 an increase in, in funding or something. This, this is, is a problem that, you can find you can find a solution via a, a, like a mindset or a behavior shift in educators or students within your school. So, this uh, as we started to do this research and uh, started to learn more about positive deviance, we were really intrigued, um, and we started to ask ourselves how might this positive deviance approach work in K twelve education. And so uh, we decided to try it ourselves. And I'm going to let Laura tell a little a short case study about a way that uh, they, about Laura and, and a small team of educators uh, started using the positive deviance process to see if this is something that could be sticky in K-12 education. Great. And I, I'm dropping in the chat, Devin, too. There's a lot of conversation about appreciative inquiry, which I am a huge fan of. Um, Absolutely. And I've done a lot of that work uh, at High Takai and other communities of practice about leveraging what we call the National School Reform uh, Protocol Success Analysis and have leveraged that. And I will say, as someone who like had a grounding in this like asset framing, what was interesting about this is like the use of data. So I'll talk a little bit about add that as that data usage in this example. So let's look at this idea of higher education access. Do you want to go to the next slide, Devin? Thank you. So I am sitting with 198 educators and we all know there are systemic factors that we are all the time dealing with in K-12 funding, 
right? This idea of teacher preparation that doesn't actually prepare educators for the range of challenges they will face. As someone who substituted for a year before teaching, I understand that concept very well. This idea of placements, reward systems, decentivizing working conditions in schools that of course serve students who are furthest from opportunity, compensation for teachers, right? Curriculum in classrooms. There is a wall, as you see from there, right? Of challenges, the systemic issues facing um, education and the day-to-day -day practices. And as someone who spends a lot of time in schools, we're always trying to solve those problems. But as Devin just shared in the next slide, what can we do right now? How can we actually understand what's working well in our classrooms? How do we do right now to help students facing access challenges right now? And so my colleague, Mark Chun, who's actually on this call, um, who's a, obviously one of the massive project leaders on this, um, this project, he and I taught a class about positive deviance, I think, I feel like two years ago, but it was only, I think, a year ago during the pandemic, uh, that leveraged positive deviance around the FAFSA. So if you want to go to the next slide, Devin. One of the challenges that we saw, and for those of you who, um, who understand college access and looking at college completions, one of the barriers to actually making um, college affordable is the completion of the FAFSA, right? This idea of how many students complete the FAFSA. If anyone has spent any time in high school, getting young folks to actually uh, sign the applications, getting all the data um, done with respect to college admissions and college access, is an entire project in and of itself, and it is confusing. And for those of you who have actually spent time on the FAFSA, it's actually quite confusing. Um, if you are a first-generation student, understanding not only what the FAFSA is, what it can do for you, and how it actually can support financial risk, is um, financial affordability of college is a massive challenge. And so we looked at the problem and we saw like FAFSA completion rate. Do you want to go back? Thanks. Um, and looked at this idea of like, it was dropping, not only of course during the pandemic, like how do we actually share information about what the FAFSA is? Fewer students are applying to college, financial aid is coming, and yet there are ways to actually figure out. So what we did, and if you wanna to go to the next slide, thanks, um, is we like taught a class and we said, imagine you were a part of a consortium of five schools. And they wanted every school, right, to get every single student to submit the FAFSA on time. Right, that was what the case we were talking about. And then we said, what do we already know about the process of completing the FAFSA? And as a former advisor to young people, I have my own lived experience about what it means to do the FAFSA. But we were curious about what schools are doing to complete the FAFSA with their young people and who is getting the highest rates and how are they doing it? So we talked a little bit about, um, I wanna go to the next slide, Devin. Thanks. Um, we started looking at data. We started to collect some data about the completion rates. And we asked ourselves like, what would we do first? What would we do? What would we ask? And this entire class, what we decided is we ended up bringing this data to the young people in our class and you'll see different rates. You wanna to go to the next slide, Devin? And what we found is that we looked at schools across San Diego actually, and we found a difference between small high schools and large comprehensive high schools. And we discovered that in a couple different schools where, where they were serving a similar population of young people, some schools actually had a higher FAFSA completion rate than others, despite the fact they were actually in the same district, they have the same number of teachers, they have the same number of students with a similar demographic. And we asked ourselves, how is this possible? What's going on there? That given that most of the conditions were similar across these networks and across these schools, that some schools actually were outperforming others. You'll see a big high school had the mean of 59% and a small school at 81%. So not surprising, we spent a lot of the class actually trying to figure out why were these schools that are lit up in red, the positive deviance? Why were they performing at a higher rate than others? They became the positive outliers, the positive deviance, the bright spots, and how we could actually help young people complete the FAFSA. And what we discovered um, was actually something very simple, is that they only did relatively three things. They weren't, oh my gosh, we created this amazing app, we created this program, no, no, they created very simple practices. One, 
was that they actually moved up the FOSFA deadline earlier to young people so that the, it was almost an artificial deadline for young people to complete the FAFSA so they would get it in on time. They changed the deadline to help young people say, no, it's really due next week, but the giving people an extra deadline so they can capture all the students who missed the first deadline. The second thing that they did is they did massive outreach in multiple languages, particularly with first generation families who didn't actually have experience working with the FAFSA. And then they spent time in school and after school helping parents, young people actually complete the FAFSA. Now, when we looked at this, we're like, wow, that's actually pretty simple to do. And we started applying these bright spots to other communities. And what was great about understanding this process deeply was that the things that these schools did, these positive deviants, these bright spots, what they could do was actually applicable to other people in their communities because it was the same communities. They found bright spots and bright ways and bright practices of actually increasing the FAFSA that anyone can do that didn't cost a whole lot more money, didn't actually radically change more time, but it actually was a behavior and a practice that anyone could access and also have the confidence in knowing it could work because it was working in a similar school right down the street with the same number of teachers and the same population of students. Right, This idea that it was a simple practice that anyone could do that allowed them to increase the FAFSA. So I'm going to kick it back to Devin. He's going to talk more about some of this um, work. And yes, actually, it's our CARFA FAFSA change management. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Ledger. Thanks, Laura. And yeah, I, I think um, that, that's a great case study, a great example, because I think it's quite obvious when you hear kind of the what the actual bright spots were that emerged is none of them were really, you know, out there, right? They weren't these like wild and crazy ideas that um, you can't really understand how to implement. They were quite obvious, right? And, and Laura had mentioned uh, that like those, those, those schools that were identified as the outliers, as the bright spots, they likely didn't know that they were out, that they were those outliers. They didn't know, know that they uh, were doing something that was really exceptional because it just seemed intuitive to them, right? They were just reacting to their school community and to what their students needed. And so that's the, the beauty of positive deviance. And um, I, I, I'm sorry, there's someone um, in the chat had mentioned, um, oh, Luciana had mentioned that, you know, that this, this feels like it's really, um, you know, equitable and it really, it, it, it increases the uh, kind of ability to kind of bring equity interventions into schools. And that's exactly right because what you're doing is you're responding and reacting to what your community needs and what and to what your community serves and rather than trying to bring in some external consultants um, or some folks who you know are, are trying to help you kind of think of these new and novel approaches it's just asking you to look at what's already working and um, you know positive deviance says there are folks in your community who are already solving this problem let's learn from them let's not go outside and look elsewhere for solutions let's look internally it really helps to kind of bring more empowerment to teachers, to educators, to schools, to be able to look at each other as these um, these these potential bright spots and folks who can solve these problems, these intractable, these messy, complicated problems, rather than having to rely on other people to help you solve these problems. Um, so, we were really intrigued by this case, case study, right? Because, um, like I mentioned. Uh, positive deviance has been used really widely in, in different industries and it had been used a little bit in k-12 but not not it has it doesn't seem like it's been widely adopted it doesn't seem like it's a process that had kind of taken off as um a, a problem solving uh kind of process that schools were picking up and taking on when it really you know led to a lot of kind of intuitive intuitive solutions and so uh we were intrigued and we started to wonder how might we, how might school and district communities use this approach to solve these intractable problems? And how can they complete this process along a timeline that works for busy, busy practitioners who are dealing with uh, coming back to school from COVID, all of the other external factors that are impacting schools? How can we introduce this process in a way that feels tang that feels uh, you know, manageable? and feels uh, like it's something that, that schools can kind of take on as a problem solving approach. And so we also then start to ask ourselves, how can we introduce this process to more educators and more schools to help them unveil more bright spots within their schools so that they're able to start to use this process to surface those outliers and surface those, um, those problems. And uh, so we started testing it. 
uh, we started uh, adapting the process to test uh, in uh, K-12 schools across the U.S. and internationally. And uh, we, we renamed it from positive deviance to community-led problem solving, which again, I, I mentioned that we were using those terms interchangeably and I wanna give a little bit more context into why. Uh, in the springtime, we received a lot of feedback that uh, kind of the, the notion of finding deviant behavior had a really negative connotation in school communities. No one really wanted to be seen as like a deviant, even if it was you know, in a, in a, in a positive way. And so we started kind of working with schools to figure out like what would be the best a better way to kind of frame this process that would feel um, you know, feel like a like a process that you could kind of take on and immediately understood. And we we landed on community led problem solving as an approach. But positive deviance is the is the process and the framework that we're using. So this is the process that we began testing. And I'm going to just share a little bit more uh, details about how this actually kind of manifests in a school community. So. The first step in, uh, in uh, community-led problem solving is that the community identifies an intractable problem. And remember um, that these intractable problems are problems that are uh, resistant to kind of permanent solutions. They're not just a problem that popped up this year that you haven't really tried um, a ton of different ways to, to solve this yet. This is a problem that you have had in your school for, for a long time and you've just not figured out a way to, to, to solve that problem, right? Um, you you can these are some examples of some intractable problems that you could that we we've asked some schools that we've been working with to kind of start with um so an example right with civic engagement our school needs to develop ways to enable more students to participate in quality and quantity and community and civic life so that's an example of an intractable problem that a school could start to use this process to solve so once a school has kind of identified and landed on that intractable problem, um, and again, this isn't just the school leadership who is who is identifying this problem. This is the school community. So this is um, ideally a collection of educators, of school support and admin, administrative, administrative staff, ideally some input from students and, and parents and other community members to ensure that like, yes, this is actually a problem that's existing. This isn't just a problem that the school leadership is identifying as a problem. Um, once you kind of land and identify your intractable problem that you want to solve, you then um, start to seek those outliers. You start to seek those bright spots that are emerging, um, those positive performers that uh, for some reason or another, you don't know why yet, but they have been able to kind of, uh, you know, be, be those positive deviants um, and, and be able to kind of start to, to solve, to, to become outliers um, related to this problem. And so um, Laura kind of had shared how in the FAFSA example, you, they use the P-chart data analysis tool. And that's the tool that we have been testing and using with schools in the past. Um, it's essentially a, an Excel document where you plug in uh, relevant data related to your uh, intractable problem, which helps you kind of reveal these outliers, right? Re reveal these uh, unusual positive performers. Um, so th some examples of different types of data that you could use could be like student attendance data, um, different types of school assessment data, teacher retention, you, this could be also like a student survey around belonging and how safe they feel in school. So this can be data that was is, is something that already exists, or this can be some data that you as a team, once you've landed on your intractable problem, can start to capture via surveys or other ways of um, kind of use of seeking this quantitative data. So um, and then these are some kind of questions that once you once you have done this uh, quantitative data capture, you can start to analyze this, look and see, what do you notice about the distribution of your data? Are there outliers? Where are they? And then what does it mean to be an outlier above or below the control limits? And then start to kind of dig into those, those outliers. What do you, why do you think they exist? Before you do any additional work, just start to have conversations and some kind of reflection around why you think that this outlier is existing right now. And then what is this telling you right now about your school community with regard to your problem? This might actually, uh, th this, this part of the process might actually tell you, oh, ha, huh, like we don't have the right data set. We're actually not using the right data yet. You might realize that through using through this part of the process that you need to go back and seek different types of data. Or this might tell you that your problem might not be intractable. That maybe the problem that you've identified as the problem that you want to use this process with is not the right type of problem. So this is a really good kind of check moment for you to ensure before you move forward that positive deviance is the right approach uh, for your intractable problem. So once you've done this qualitative data capture, um, you then are 
it, you, you've identified those outliers I, ideally, right? And then you have kind of had those conversations about some hunches around why these outliers exist. Um, but now it's time to figure out what are they doing? So why do they, why do they actually exist? What are they doing that's differently? Where, are, what is the bright spot behavior that's enabling them to um, be these, these positive performers given no additional resources? And so um, the, we, we've, we've kind of been practicing and, and testing a few different um, tools to, uh, to uh, methods, excuse me, tools and methods to uh, capture this qualitative data. And these probably look familiar to you if you're familiar with uh, design thinking, because the, and that was kind of our intention is that this part of the process should feel really familiar. So uh, what we, what we ask uh, schools and what we would ask you to do is to first do some empathy interviews. Uh, once you've identified those outliers, have some conversations perhaps with those folks who are identified as the outliers and also have with students, bring some students together and then do some interviews with them around the intractable problem, why that exists. And if they themselves have any um, ideas or any hunches around maybe some educators who they believe are bright spots because they are helping them feel safer in school, they're helping them um, become more civically engaged. Um, this is another opportunity for you to be able to identify outliers through this qualitative data. Uh, once you've done your empathy interviews and kind of gleaned more potential bright spots or gained deeper insight into why those outliers exist, then you shadow, you, you select a few of those outliers and you go into their classroom, you go into their office, you go into the space where, where they are doing this work and you observe. Um, again, you know, with shadowing, it's really not about evaluation. You're not evaluating their, their, their teaching, their, their instructional practices. What you're doing is just trying to get a sense of like, what are they doing? What are their interactions with students like? What are the things that are on the walls? What are some things that we can see them doing in practice that is giving us some deeper insight into what that bright spot behavior might be. So from Laura's FAFSA example, um, when, they, when they conducted this, they were able to see these, uh, these guidance counselors uh, providing this uh, diff, you know, multi-language instruction around FAFSA completion to these parents. They were able to see the guidance counselors like working with the students and kind of giving them this arbitrary deadline for FAFSA that uh, kind of came up as kind of that key, that key moment that could create some lasting change. Because if you remember, many times these, these, uh, these outliers, these, these bright spots, they don't know that they're bright spots. They don't know why they've been identified. And so your work here is kind of investigating and trying to figure out what are those things that they're doing? What are the behaviors and practices that they're, that they're, that they're doing naturally that we can learn from? Once you've done those shadow observations, then we're at, we're, we would ask you to kind of gather a community um, of, of educators, a community of students together, and then start to get some, start to have another conversation and kind of clarify some of those assumptions that you may have made during the shadow and during the empathy interviews to learn more about why did you do this thing in your classroom? What did this mean to you when you said this? Can you tell me more about when I saw this happen in your classroom? What, what did this, what was actually happening here? Because again, that can give you some deeper insight into what that bright spot behavior is so that you can eventually uh, find a way to share and to spread and to scale these bright spots to other folks within your school community. So, um, this part of the process is, is, is quite different, like I mentioned in the, in the very beginning, than the design thinking process, because this isn't just about you taking these bright spots and saying, here are the bright spots, now go do these in your own classrooms, right? That's, that's, not, that's totally counter to um, the way that positive deviance works, because what, we're at, what we would ask you to do here is to basically share and present your findings with your school community. This could be through a staff meeting, this could be through an assembly, this could be through a newsletter or some other way of sharing this work widely across your school community. And then gathering them together and saying, okay, how, what's the best way to take this work forward? Who should we engage in this? Who wants to be a part of figuring out how to scale and to implement this process? This shouldn't be a process that's just done with a small group of, of educators. This should be something that is inclusive of your entire school community. And we found that by, and from the research from the positive deviant, deviance work in the past, has found that by engaging a wider, a wider school community in this, um, you have a much, uh, much higher possibility of kind of, a, of an uptick in this bright spot behavior because you're enabling and empowering the rest of your community to be a part of this process and a part of the implementation plan. 
Um, and remember that this solution is a lot less risky than scaling a novel new idea because you're, you're scaling an existing solution that's already been proven to work, not in you know, high tech high or a, way, a different school that's far away from your own school. It's been proven to work within your own school and your own community. It already fixed, so it won't cause disruption. And so that's the process that we've been working on and testing um, over the last uh, three months or so. Uh, and uh, this is what our current prototype looks like. Uh, over uh, since September, we have been working with 15 schools, uh, which are both US based and international. I see some people from our cohorts on this call. I won't call them out right now, but I might later. Uh, but we have been working with them and kind of taking them through this positive deviance process over the course of nine weeks. Uh, our goal is to capture bright spots that are related to these four focus areas assessment, belonging, civic engagement and culturally responsive teaching. And in the new year, we're planning to release these bright spots and a toolkit for K-12 educators who are interested in taking on this process and using it in their own school community. So we are very excited to be kind of at the very end of this professional development experience because we've been learning a lot about this process and about the best way to implement this in a K-12 context. And so uh, we would love to uh, you know, be able to engage with you all on this work and also to be able to share our findings. Um, but let me check the time. So I think uh, we, I, I feel like Laura and I have been talking a lot for <laughs> the last uh, 45 minutes. And um, I think we have time just for a really short video uh, from one of our educators who we worked with in the spring, um, who uh, has kind of, who recorded a short video about how this positive deviance process has kind of shifted the way that she thinks about equity and advancing equity um, in her work. And so I'm gonna see if this works. Let's cross our fingers and hope the tech gods are on my side. Positive deviance, I believe, and I would make the argument that it is essential um, for, if we really strive to be equitable in our teaching, if we want to bring practices of equity, we have to look at what is working. Um, so many times you look at what is not working and then you have outside people coming in trying to give you advice. They don't know your community. I can read everything in the world about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can go to workshops, but until I actually sit down and listen to students in my community, having tools that will help me um, listen better, ask better questions, so that then I know where do you feel safe? Where do you feel that your identity is seen and valued? By looking at what the students say and by identifying those people who are bright spots, we are able then to, I think, better transform our own practices and awarenesses within our own building. Um, because this is a community where um, the students we know and the teachers we know are doing things well. Let's learn from them and then practice. And then you have built in partnerships right there in your own building so that you can continue to work. So with that, um, I want to not play that again. Um, I just want to kind of close by just, just kind of providing you with my contact information. If you're interested in learning more, if you're interested in kind of uh, receiving some early drafts of this toolkit, I would we would love to kind of have you engaged. Um, like I said, we're, we're, we're aiming to release this toolkit and to release the findings uh, from this work uh, early next year. And so, uh, and it will, it will also be provided across the K-12 lab if you're a part of the newsletter and other, other um, you know, uh, sp spaces like that. Um, but please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll also drop some um, other articles and literature and research into the WhatsApp group following uh, this call, if anyone's interested in learning more about that process. Um, but I'm going to turn it back over to Laura to kind of do our final closeout. And I'm loving, I'm also loving this chat. This is like one of the most, I love having this group of folks on this call because it definitely feels like an engaged group of people. And I'm loving Lucy, who's National School Farm faculty. We're already like private chatting, like when we're gonna connect uh, back and forth. And so one of the things that I just wanna share, you know, personally, as I think about this program in particular, is thinking a lot about how this work, um, one of the things that I think that I think is interesting, I think we've got a couple of questions and I'll kick it to Jeremy to kind of um, facilitate that with everyone is this question that I feel like has been such um, a piece, which is why, you know, I love the National School Reform Faculty Protocols um, and the use of that, 
is because we learn by doing, we learn by action and we learn by, um, by dialogue. And one of the really interesting things about this work in particular that I have found to be very, um, I'd say profound is in this moment in time, I feel like for such a long time in schools, design has been an innovation, has been about dropping new ideas into communities and telling teachers we are not innovative enough. You need to do the thing because you're not doing something innovative. You're not doing that practice. And I think there's something um, I would say beautiful and also dispositionally important in this practice that really reminds us that the practices teachers are doing every single day are innovative. And this, this protocol, this, this process we're engaging in not only brings that asset framing, but also gives some rigor, allowing us to actually do the design work, go deeper in why these are working and also start measuring it to see what we're trying to solve and how we can improve, whether it's FAFSA, whether it's civic engagement, whether we're thinking about culture responsive teaching, really getting into why those practices work and how, and really understanding that they are innovative. I was telling Devin, and I think there's some folks on this call from the Campbell School of Innovation, uh, which is a public school down in San Jose. And uh, we did a positive deviance workshop on Monday. And we had 40 educators look at how they are cultivating design in their classrooms. And they shared how they teach empathy, how they taught ideation, how they taught testing. And these were just little practices they were doing every single day that they were uncovering as a bright spot. And at the very end of the day, we circled up and we talked about it. And one of our, our teachers had been there. He said, what's really great about the practices in this room is that they're innovative, but I also know they are going to work because they're working in my building. They're working with the folks and the young people that I serve every single day. I know they work because the teacher next door is using them and she's finding ways to do this and he's finding ways to do this. And that dispositional shift of not innovation dropping in on us and saying, you should try this because so-and-so did it in some other place uh, and it worked for them, but really bringing the mindset that innovation is with all, within all of us, that creativity, innovation, we all have that capacity. And then this process around discovering our own positive deviance within ourselves, right, is a process, is a way that we can actually uncover it and bring that together and actually shine the light on each of our own um, capacities and efficacy, as Stephanie just put in the chat. So um, I'm going to kick it over to Jeremy. He's going to close us up. He's got like a Q&A, kind of round it up, and we're going to kick it off and close it out. But thank you all, all right. so, so much. Yeah, first, can we just give uh, Devin and Laura fireworks applause, if you can join me with some fireworks applause. Yeah, thank you for sharing this incredibly powerful and impactful content. Laura, I just want to kick the first question to you because it kind of dovetails nicely with what you were just talking about there. Uh, Gloriella Aguina Colon says, what tips do you have for framing and messaging when launching a community led problem solving process, especially with folks who are hesitant or who have had negative experiences with evaluation or research before? That's a really great question because I think this question is really, it's not about evaluation. I think there, I, have, I don't know if you all have been in meetings where you look at test scores and it becomes a fair, I'm looking at William like, oh yeah, that's a bad meeting right up the dot. There is a dispositional shift of who is not doing it well. Who's at the bottom becomes the question. How do we improve the people that are lowing? There's at the low bottom and that becomes always the frame. It's a deficit mindset. And I think there are ways to start small in this process, as Devin said, going out and seeing these bright spots, shadowing students and having conversations um, within this. And there are ways to kind of slowly emerge in, um, as Lucy put in the chat, appreciative inquiry, success analysis are small ways people can actually start doing just to get into the modality of understanding their own brilliance understanding our own brilliance and actually shining the things that we individually do well feels awkward. <laughs> we actually don't like to do it. And yet in order for us to actually get better, we have to appreciate the brilliance that each of us are bringing to the space. And so thank you, Lisa, for dropping that in the chat. Those are small ways to start. 
And then as Devin said, starting to actually uncover what do we actually think is worth solving, right, Devin? What are the intractable problems and how can we start? What are we doing right now? That actually is very simple that someone else can start doing. And maybe I'll have Devin chime into that answer because I know that that's how they started, Jeremy. This, this entire fellowship is actually getting to do that exact answer is how to get people excited and starting to do this. That's awesome. Devin, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with what Laura said, and I really love that question. I think that one one thing that we I, I, we maybe didn't hit on as 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 much as we should have um, is that the, the importance of the community the community piece. Um, like what in term in terms of like it's there there may be a small group of folks who are kind of launching into this work and kind of seeing this work and using this work to kind of guide guide the initial kind of process around solving the intractable problem. But there is a step um, in between kind of identifying the intractable problem and then kind of going out and capturing this qualitative and quantitative data where we ask, where folks are asked to do a community launch event where basically they, uh, where we ask them to kind of gather, gather the community and kind of share, share what's happening and share what they're, what they're attempting to do and then ask for buy-in and uh, ask for folks to kind of be, join in and be a part of this work. And that has worked really well because not only does that, you know, just, just kind of uh, provide deep transparency into what the work is, but it's also about galvanizing the rest of the community to, to say like, we're, we're not solving this problem for you. We want to solve this problem together. And so I think leaning into the um, kind of community involvement space and providing lots of opportunities, not just for the school, the school leadership or the teachers to be involved in the work, but for the school support staff, for the maintenance workers, for the parents, for students, for everyone that you know is a part of this of your school community to give them a, a play a role to play in this work so it, it it moves away from being like Laura mentioned like this is you know a solution that we're providing to you and like this is a process and something that we're all doing together because this is a problem that we realize is really important and we need to solve as a community to make our school better for students for our families for our educators for everyone and so I think really leaning into that community involvement piece is is key. Um, and again, in the WhatsApp, I'll be, I, I can share some more resources around like what that community launch can look like and some case studies um, from other industries uh, where uh, com the community launch has been like an integral and kind of a, a real like pivotal part in, in the process. I was just about to ask uh, Laura to smile, but then she did because <clears throat> she actually smiled right then because I'm tweeting how much I loved your session today. Uh, folks, if you want to scan the QR code on your screen, you can give these uh, these fantastic women some love as well, and hopefully share the message of these sessions. We've got another four, five, six, seven, twenty-five. Who knows how many we'll end up doing uh, lined up? But we want to extend the reach and impact of these sessions. We believe that these are incredibly powerful tools that deserve a wider audience and communities that are in need of transformation and impact but we don't know how to reach them and we can't reach them without your help. So feel free to share, feel free to point folks to our website, mastersofcreativity.stanford.edu, where we've got a bunch of the past talks and signups for future talks as well. <laughs> um, and share with your friends, share with your colleagues, with your, uh, with your schools, et cetera. Yeah, Devin. Um, and Jeremy, um, so on December, I believe December 2nd, uh, Mark Chun, myself, and then uh, uh, Jess Brown and Peter Worth, uh, we are the team that have been leading this work um, with, with the cohorts. And so in December for the next Master of Creativity series, we'll be able to share, the, the program is still happening. It's still, we're still in the, in the middle of the program. And so in December, we'll be able to, it, it won't be the same as this presentation. We'll be sharing what happened and we'll be sharing some more tangible tools and outcomes from this work. So yeah, really highly encourage everyone to, to join that because um, we would love to have a bunch of educators on that call as well. So um, I'll, we'll, yeah, please please uh, join that if you can. Um, would love to have you all there to hear about how this process actually landed once we um, are fully through the process. And, yeah, and I will jump in. And Oh, go ahead, Laura, please. Oh, I would just jump in and say that's where one of the final things is like, I love the WhatsApp, the WhatsApp group. It like, I think the first time we did this, uh, Jeremy, right, the whole thing shut down because everyone was so excited and we like broke WhatsApp, which is great. And I would I encourage, I was like, yes. yes. How um, many times do you like, you get to say you're a part of breaking WhatsApp? People, yeah. <laughs> this is important. We're making history here. Yeah. Um, that's great. But I, you know, I'm thinking about how the questions is like what I love about, you know, Jeremy and, and what you have created the mass is like these community questions 
And what I've been noticing on my WhatsApp group is the questions and the conversations that have followed up as a result of this. And so, you know, obviously part of being a community is actually not knowing the answer yet and sharing resources that we all can use. And so if you're in the WhatsApp group, start sharing. What is your intractable problem? What are you trying to figure out? What are some bright spots that you already are seeing? Because the more that we actually share the innovations within our own communities, the better we all get, right? We don't need to hide brilliance or hide innovation. We all can have access to these practices. And that is part of what I love about being in these communities and these conversations that we are all, as Jeremy said, we are all working together to unlock and shine a light on our own creative practices. And it's doing it in community that brings me joy. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Devin. Shout out to the whole K-12 team, the D-School team, and all of you for joining. It's incredibly humbling to see people joining from around the world. We know, like, I think last time we had somebody set their alarm at 3 a.m. so they could join us. That is YouTube works, people. We will post these to YouTube later. <laughs> Not that we don't love to be with you live, but we understand if you need sleep, it's all good.